welcome to this episode of The Soul Trap and back in the studio, live and in person with his lovely bride behind the camera. We have Jeffrey Grider, the founder of Now the End Begins and now also the pastor of... Bethany Baptist Church. Bethany Baptist Church. It has been far too long since he has been with us, but we have him back in. We have to be careful. When he and I are in the same proximity, sometimes mm. the universe uh, gets thrown out of whack a little bit. And I can promise you that NSA has tapped into everything we're going to be talking <laughs> about here today. But we're glad to have him and excited. And we look forward to this interview. Jeff, thanks for being with us. We're so happy that you're here. Amen. Thank you for having us. It's great to be back in the Soul Trap studio. Absolutely. Tell us, for those that are maybe tuning in for the first time, tell us in, a, in as briefly as you can, what Now the End Begins is, how did it start, and what's its goal? Now the End Begins started about 15 years ago, and it originally started as a knee-jerk, gut-level reaction to the presidency of Barack Obama. And when I looked at this man who was about to become the next president of the United States and realized his extreme socialist, communist background, it set off every warning red flag in my head that I could possibly ever have. And because when we were in school, they taught that socialism was bad. Yeah. They thought they taught that communism was bad to the point of being a sin. Yeah. Exactly. And now here we have a president that em embraces all that. So I prayed about it and the Lord gave me that name of Now the End Begins. And I made a little splash page back in the end of 2008. But then I didn't do anything with it for about a year. And then God reminded me to pick it back up. And what I originally envisioned that it would be, you remember Glenn Beck with his, his chalkboard, his whiteboard, and he was talking about all this great news stuff, and, uh -huh, and he uh -huh. splashed a lot of conspiracy theory. Yes, yes. I love that, yeah. just like you do. Uh -huh. I love that. And so that, to me, is what Now the End Begins originally started out to be. It was news with a little bit of Bible thrown in. Uh -huh. But then as I started doing it and the Lord started saying, well, you know, you got some gaps in your Bible knowledge. Why don't you crack the books and go yeah. back? And so over the years, it went from being mostly news and a little bit of Bible uh -huh. to a lot of Bible. And then we still have the news aspect of uh -huh. it. Now, there's really, for lack of a better word, I, I don't want to say an audience, it's really become a congregation online, hasn't it? I mean, you really, uh, now, I know now that you're in a brick and mortar building, but, but there really is a congregation that you've been ministering to for, what, 10 years now? Well, I would say that the first three years of Now the End Begins was really just kind of getting my feet wet. I had never done, I had never written a blog, I had never written anything. Um, but I really enjoyed it, and I began to see that perhaps the Lord gave me a talent for it. So I spent the first couple of years developing that aspect and trying to, you know, kick up my writing game and be better at it, you uh -huh, know. Uh -huh. um, and then around 2011, 2012, that's where we started the online Bible study. Okay. And then that's where things really started to move into a different direction. And we have people listening now who have been listening since 2012, 2013. And on average, you know, from a congregation perspective, if we were going to have a brick and mortar building mm -hmm. um, to fit everybody who listens to us on a monthly basis, you would need something the size of, um, I don't know, what football stadium holds 60,000 people. Yeah, that's but, pretty crazy. Yeah, isn't but it? on average, we have between 55 and 60,000 people tuning in every single month. Yeah. to listen, and about another 900,000 who just come to read the articles. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Then yes. God would do something like that. Yeah. And what's amazing about it is, is that even though it, it is, now the end begins, I do think that it does, it is cutting edge. One of the things I've noticed over the years is that some of the websites and some of the, I won't say ministries, but some of the different places, platforms, I should say, <laughs> yeah. um, they go cutting edge and then they go they start to go off the deep end mm -hmm. there seems to be a pretty strong balance of revelation and rational in other words this is what the bible says and then there are some conspiracy but there's also just rational news here mm -hmm. look at what's going on mm -hmm. use your head mm -hmm. how do you maintain that balance without 
going off the deep end, you know, some of these guys go down the rabbit hole, and, and how do you maintain that? Is that just a Bible position? Is it? What, what do you think? There's only one way to maintain it, and it's funny because we were talking about this last week on either the Bible study or something, and people will ask me, you spend all this time with all this end times news, which is, it can be frustrating, confusing, bewildering, terrifying, and yes. intimidating. I mean, how many people do we know that died during COVID? Oh my goodness, yes. I, at least five or six people that were friends of mine. Yes, we that, had people in the church. Yeah, yeah, that didn't make it through that time period. And people ask me on a fairly regular basis, how do you keep from going crazy or being hyper-focused on that? Well, you get to First Thessalonians chapter 4, where it's talking about the rapture of the church. And Paul uh -huh. says that he's going to come down to the clouds and he's going to pull us up. Uh -huh. and, and what's the last verse? I think it's verse 18. Wherefore, Wherefore comfort. comfort. Right. Right? right. right. That's where the comfort is. That's why the apostles didn't go crazy. Yeah. Right. If you think about it, how if you had to operate Suncoast Baptist Church with the sheriff's office, constantly dragging people out of your church and we're coming for you next. Yeah, yeah. How could you pop? Well, if you focus on the Lord and you focus on the promises in that book. So it's interesting you said that because this is not really necessarily soul trap, but I've been thinking a lot about, in fact, I talked with Matt Crane in another interview mm -hmm. and we were talking about the deeper life. We're talking about the deeper truths. And I think one of the places where we stop, and I've said this before, I think Ephesians and Colossians are some of the most deep books, even maybe deeper than Revelation. We get to the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and it's almost if we stop. But he is the heavenly man. He's the head of a new race. We are new creatures. We are seated with him in glory right now. Yeah. When you start thinking about the ramifications of who we are and what's happening around the corner, then you're right. The comfort, the strength, we're just not of this world. Right. We're just buying time. Right. We're waiting for him to come. And I, I used the illustration the other day when I was preaching of being a scuba diver mm -hmm. and that weighted belt where mm -hmm. you unhook that weighted belt and you'll naturally start to, to go up because that water is not your natural environment. Right. And I feel like that's what we are. We're kind of got this weighted belt of the old man around us. Right. But when the rapture happens and we cut loose, mm -hmm. we're just not, we're just going to ascend like Christ. We're just not naturally of this environment anymore. That's where our strength comes from. The, mm -hmm. We're, ob we're observers of this world. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you start looking at all the craziness, it's what keeps you sane. And that's what I think that they're really talking about in the book of Acts, where it says, and they have all things common, right? Now, that's where Stalin and Lenin look yeah, at yeah. that, and they come up with communism. But when I look at that, based on what we're talking about, they had all things in common because they didn't care about their possessions anymore, mm -hmm. right? If... You suddenly said to your church members, let's d take all of our stuff. Some of you have a lot. Some of you have a little. Let's all just dump it in a pile and live, you know, and there may be some people, not necessarily in your church, but there may be some people who's like, well, I have a lot. I don't uh -huh. want to dump it into a pile because I'm holding on. Those things mean something to me. Yeah. To them, it didn't mean so much. You want to dump it in a pile? Take it. Yes. Because my home is not here. Yes, I really think that. I really think that the more we can recognize, that's why I think sometimes the study of prophecy has become, what's the word I want to use? I think the study of prophecy has almost become dry. It's almost become a race to catalog information. But when you really recognize that we are in Christ, just as Adam was the head of the human race, we have a second Adam. We are a different being. We're a new creature. We have a new home, a new destiny. Um, and so these things of the world, they, the more we can by faith recognize what he's saying, not, not that you will be, we are glorified in Christ, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the more you can see those deeper truths, the more it detaches you from this world. And I think a lot of modern Christians, even those that are studying prophecy, they're studying it as if they're a part of it, mm -hmm. but, but we're not. We have to keep in mind that we are seated in Christ. We right. are above, not below. And that's a hard thing to do because it's faith, and faith mm -hmm. is always hard. Mm -hmm. So now the end begins uh, when you go to the website, amazing website, amazing information. 
But uh, we're here, and so I thought, well, hey, let's, uh, let's dive in. I couldn't help. I had this on my notes to talk about already, but I thought while we were getting set up, let me just check the website, and I do that anyway every day. Right on the front one, you have Tehran, Iran, Israel conducting Air Force drills in preparation for a strike on Iranian nuclear facilities. Um, the war in Iran, and, uh, the war with Iran and Israel has been brewing for some time. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you a little theory I'm thinking about. Okay. Um, and boy, I know I'm already feeling the number of emails and comments coming in. <laughs> I love it. So I think that uh, all things being equal, if I have my choice, I would rather have Donald Trump than Joe Biden. Amen. But I think that there is an undue misunderstanding. And I think it's very possible that we could go to war under Donald Trump. Yeah. We went to war under Bush. We went to war under his dad. The Democrats, they do a lot of different things, but when we go to war, it always seems to be under uh, a, a, a Republican here recently. I'm interested in what your thoughts are. What does a war with Iran look like globally for us? And then ultimately for us as a Christian, you know, pre-rapture, but does that necessarily mean pre-World War III? What, mm -hmm. what do you see happening over in Tehran and, and Israel? Well, it's kind of like when you look at the Vietnam War. Okay, I was a tiny little kid, but I remember people wearing the silver bracelets where uh, it was the POW bracelets. Mm -hmm. And I remember that. I mean, I was only six or seven, but that is like sealed in my mind. And if you think about it from a military perspective, we should have we should have wiped them out fairly easily and fairly quickly. But not only did we not do that and we lost tens of thousands of I think 55,000 55, yeah. American troops that we lost um, and we didn't win that war. We lost yeah. that war. Yeah. OK. And Iran presents a similar situation because from a military perspective, I mean, it would be over in a week, mm -hmm. two weeks mm -hmm. from a pure military perspective. But they have entrenched themselves very smartly, very prophetically. You read the book of Ezekiel, you read the Old Testament, and you have Persia, you have Libya, you have Lebanon, you have Russia, Turkey, and China, uh -huh. and they're all embedded with each other. So if you want to go after them, all sorts of problems pop up that have nothing to do with who's the stronger country or who has the biggest military. Yeah. Now, Russia has spent the last 12 years building the nuclear reactors that Israel, the article that you're talking about, wants to take out and destroy. Uh -huh. Russia would feel compelled to step up. Um, I think it was two or three years ago. No, it was four years. It was in 2020. And um, Russia, Iran and China signed a pact uh -huh. of mutual military assistance, mm -hmm. kind of like a like a. NATO it flew under the thing. radar at the time because we had a lot of other things going on, mm -hmm. obviously with COVID and things like that. But yeah, I remember that distinctly. Yeah. So if you go after them, now you risk raising up Russia, okay, which you think, well, America can beat Russia. Look how Russia struggles with Ukraine. But Napoleon thought that Russia would be a cakewalk. Hitler got as far as Stalingrad uh -huh. and then lost 2.3 million Nazi soldiers. Uh, you don't beat Russia so easily. I don't care no. who you are. So you raise up Russia. Now China is going to step into the picture. Yep. And we're already percolating with Taiwan and China and the base that we have there. Um, so it's nothing but bad news no matter where that you look. And then you take into it, what is it, Brexit? You take into account the, the new economic forum that they're creating mm -hmm. with themselves. That BRICS forum? BRICS, that's yeah. it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you look at that going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, then you have the Abraham Accords taking place, mm -hmm. or that kind of craziness. Mm -hmm. So if, if Israel strikes Iran first, right. which at some point they're going to feel compelled to do. Well, let me just jump yeah, in yeah. with that thought is I think Netanyahu is on the verge of being deposed. And there is this group, this highly funded group that is able to raise anywhere from 80 to 100,000 people to go into downtown Jerusalem. Okay. Three days ago, they started going to his house. Wow. Okay. And that's bad news. And, and I haven't been able to find the missing link, but 
but uh, a lot of people are saying that the funding for that group is coming from George Soros's people, mm -hmm. Mm. just very under the wire. I haven't written about it because I can't prove it yet. Right. But somebody who hates Israel is funding that group. And I think Netanyahu knows that he is very, very much on the edge of being removed one way or the other. So, okay, so who, what do you think replaces him? What kind of leader replaces him in Israel? If he, if he gets out, what, what do you think happens in Israel? I think, because this is how close that we are, we're in the closing moments of the church age. And what is Isaiah 28, 14, or 15? Mm -hmm. Ye scornful men that rule this people, which is in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Now, Isaiah was looking forward to a time period group of scornful men ruling Israel, where's the king? Mm -hmm. There is no king. There is a group of men who are in charge. Prime Minister, Knesset, uh -huh. a group of men and women. He's talking about our time period as soon as the church age ends. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that's what comes in. I think we're that close mm. that that's what comes in behind Netanyahu. Okay. So let me back up just a little bit. Prophetically speaking, and I'm, I'm looking here, things going on, what do you think is actually, I don't think we've had a chance to really talk about this in detail, but to me, one of the most fascinating things that has happened in the last couple of years has been this issue between the Ukraine and Russia. Mm -hmm. Russia is not as weak as we're led to believe. No. And she has not rolled into the Ukraine to take over and occupy we are in a proxy war with Russia now because we're funneling money in there. But at the same time, you have to look at it almost like it's almost like a, like we're laundering money coming back. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, almost. Yeah, yeah, almost. <laughs> uh, what do you think is happening with Russia and the Ukraine? And, and how do you think, you know, uh, Trump says day one that war ends, which is a pretty aggressive statement to make. Which he, is not true. Which he gets into office. And Trump says, I voted for him twice. If he's the nominee, I'll vote for him a third time. Mm -hmm. But Trump says a lot of things that are patently right, right, false. Right, right, right. What do you think is happening with Russia and the Ukraine? Uh, and and how, what does a Christian in the end times look at that and see? I think he is biding his time and he is purposely going slow. Because what he really wants to do is he is using this attack as a foil to draw in NATO. I think that's what he is actually doing. Because there is no other reason. He has the funds, he has the military, he has the people. He could have occupied downtown Ukraine. Kiev, yeah. Right? Yeah. He could have done that a year and a half ago. Uh -huh. But he didn't do it. And he moves purposely slow. Now, we know that God likes, when God makes something, he likes to do it in threes. Uh -huh. Okay? And when we talk about the Civil War in America, everybody says, oh, 1861. Uh -huh. But the first Civil War in America was not 1861. It was 1776. Mm -hmm. Because everybody who lived here came from the same country that we fought against. Right, exactly. It was, it was brother against brother. That's Civil War number one. Yeah, and which is interesting in the history because when you read back in the history, we read back, but it was not as clear cut. The war for independence. There was a right. lot of people, the mm -hmm. Tories and others, that, that did not want that. Mm -hmm. It absolutely was a civil war. We okay. just watched this amazing Ken Burns two-part documentary on Benjamin Franklin. Uh -huh. And if you haven't seen it, you've got to watch it. It's only four hours long. And you will, be, you will come away from this thing so with your mind blown when you see... That next to George Washington, Benjamin Franklin was the single most influential person in America's independence. Uh -huh. And it lays it out why. Um, but you have the first Civil War, 1776. The second one, 1861. God does things in threes. We're headed for the third one mm -hmm. right now. So to your question, what about Ukraine, Russia, and Europe? Yeah. You look at World War I. Where was Russia? Where was Germany? Where was America? Uh -huh. Right? Where was Ukraine? You look at World War II. Where were these countries? In exactly the same place that they're going to be in World War III. Uh -huh. Okay? Uh -huh. um, World War I prepared the land for the Jewish people with the Balfour Declaration, yep. got the ball rolling. World War II prepared the Jew to go back to the land. Yes. It's a hard truth. But without the Holocaust, there's no Israel. Exactly. Okay, because there's no, there's no global sympathy. Exactly. Now, what will World War III do? 
it will drive them back out of their land mm -hmm. so that these prophecies about regathering them, right? Do you realize now that if Israel is not scattered one last time, that the vast bulk of the prophecies that are remaining to be fulfilled cannot be fulfilled because they're already there? Mm. Okay, so flesh that out a little bit. So because I think that a lot of people that are watching uh, would, would assume that the regathering from 1948, and I'm just drawing yeah. it, you know, because you can look and see 1917, the 1948, the 1967, they actually got into Jerusalem. They got that back. Right. And but then, not really. But, but not really. They haven't <laughs> got the Temple Mount, and they really don't have full control of mm -hmm. Jerusalem, but yada, yada, you, you know. But I think a lot of people say, okay, well, boy, all the boxes have been checked, so no. we're ready to go. No. Flesh that out a little bit. You're saying there's one more scattering to come. And, and I take a little bit more of a controversial position uh, where I say that in 1948, and this is something that, that came to me gradually over time in the studying of, because when you just look at it quick, like what you just yeah, said, yeah. okay, they've been regathered. But then you go back and you read Luke 21 and you read Matthew 24 and it's like, wait a second. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And then you get to Luke 21, 20 through 22. And what do you see? You see the entire and complete destruction of Jerusalem. It is gone. Mm -hmm. It is wiped out. Now, where are the Jews in this time period? Well, two thirds of the Jewish people have taken the mark of the beast and you know where they go. Uh -huh. The remnant of the Jewish people are in Sila Petra for three and a half years. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, 1948 could not possibly have been the right. final regathering. So I say. Okay. So, okay. Let me pause. For, mm -hmm. So you would say then that the destruction, the physical destruction of Israel, I'm sorry, of Jerusalem in AD 70 with Titus, mm -hmm. that was almost more of a typology mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. what was to come. Mm -hmm. A Gee, foreshadowing. Of right. It. In Matthew 24, his disciples ask him three questions, uh -huh. okay? Um, says, when will these things be? The end of Matthew 23, you know, I have longed to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chickens, but uh -huh. ye would not, okay? Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. So that's how Matthew 23 ends. You get the full context. Yep. You, you go in to Matthew 24 and his disciples say, Look at these beautiful buildings. Look at the stones. And he says, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, right? Read verse 3. Uh, and he sat upon a mount. The disciples came into him saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Right, so they're asking him three questions. Uh -huh. The first thing that they want to know about, because he had just said that the temple's going to be destroyed. Right. And then they say to him, But look at the goodly stones and all the money that it took. This can't be destroyed. And so that they ask him three questions. Well, when will these things be? Meaning the destruction of the temple. Okay. Right? Um, what shall be the sign of thy coming? They don't know what they're... What they're it's like when Peter says, let us build three tabernacles. Right, right, right. And he's like blabbering. Right, right. Right? But, but he's... I mean, those are the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah. Uh -huh. Right? So, um, when will these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of, the, of world, the world, which takes you all the way to Revelation chapter 20. Uh -huh. So when you had the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, that's as far as he allowed things to go when he pulls the plug. Uh, Daniel 9, 26 says, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the, the, the city, the temple and the sanctuary. Uh -huh. Well, who destroyed the temple and the sanctuary in 70 AD? The Romans. Mm -hmm. Where does he? What line does the Antichrist come through? Through he comes through the revived Roman Empire. Yes. Okay. So um, that was his immediate prophecy about the destruction of the temple, which got them to be dispersed. Uh huh. All right. Um, but when you were looking at the rest of these prophecies, they are prophecies that in no way, shape, or form have been fulfilled. Uh huh. And so that they have, they remain to be fulfilled and they can't be fulfilled if the Jews are in their land. Yeah. So how is that possible? So, yeah, I've heard other people say that, that one of the things that will happen is, is you'll have this, this one last battle 
where it, it, it will gather against Israel, mm -hmm. and Israel will flee. Now, I, at that point is where I've heard the different kind of discussions about, is that when the Antichrist shows up? He, he you know, he during that time is defending them, this or that, but that's when you get into the mark of the beast and that middle right. point. In the context, in Luke 21, that is the armies of the Antichrist coming against the holy city. Mm -hmm. Because remember, Luke, uh, Isaiah 14, I will be like the Most High, I will ascend, right? I will set my throne above the stars of God. Lucifer was remembering when he was a king before he fell, uh -huh. and he wants that throne back. So the establishment initially, so at the, at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation period, mm -hmm. beginning of Daniel's 70th week, mm -hmm. the biblical assumption has been is that the Antichrist will make a covenant with Israel. Mm -hmm. Right. Daniel 9.27. That land and Israel will have a covenant. Right. But let me just stop you right Go there. Ahead. He confirms the covenant. He confirms he the covenant. He doesn't make the covenant. He confirms the covenant. Right. Flesh right. that out. Well, and again, this is just my own personal belief. I believe that the Abraham Accords will lead you to that covenant that is going to be confirmed. Mm -hmm. Because so much of the Middle East now depends on those accords and nobody's really talking about them mm -hmm. okay but they're not going away either no he right. confirms the covenant and then for three and a half years israel is in what kind of situation they are once in initially for the first three and a half years before the abomination of desolation what's the situation with israel they are fat and happy they are living life under what they believe is to be the messiah you know what one of the most amazing verses is pull up um uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Okay. Okay. People have said that the temple that you see in Revelation chapter 11, okay, can't possibly be for Antichrist because John calls it the temple of God. Uh-huh. Right? But look at what Paul calls Antichrist in verse 4. Yeah, who opposes and exalting himself of all that's called God, or that is worship, so that he, talking about the man of sin, so that he, as God, capital G, uh, sitteth in the temple of God, capital G, showing himself that he is God. Oh, to them in that time period, right. that will be the return of the Messiah. They will, a majority of the Jewish people will give their complete affection to that man, believing from second, now you read further down, uh -huh. and it talks about the strong delusion. Right. Okay, right. I will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That lie is that Antichrist is the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the Jewish people will believe that, and they will get three and a half years of peace, prosperity, and safety, and their enemies won't lay a finger on them, and it is going to be something that they have never known. Complete peace. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. And when they say... Peace and safety. Then sudden, dis then sudden destruction. And that word sudden is a good cross reference over there back to Matthew mm -hmm. 24. So for three and a half years, it's interesting. I remember reading, uh, growing up, I remember reading thinking, man, sure is a lot in three and a half years until we went to 2020. <laughs> and, then, and then I was like, man, you, you can fit a whole lot in three years, man. You can fit a lot. So, so Israel's fat and happy for three and a half years. Mm -hmm. The man of sin walks in, says, I am God, right. demands that they take the mark of the beast. That's when Jesus said, you better head for the hills. And that's when Jerusalem, boom, that is when Israel is scattered to the winds again. Day one of the tribulation. Now, a lot of people say the seven-year tribulation period. You said it earlier. Dr. Ruckman used to say it. Larkin used that expression. But it's not a seven-year tribulation, even though... It's... Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I know what you're going Right. With. And just to keep the progression straight, right, you have to look at it as this seven-year time of Jacob's trouble from Jeremiah 30 with a three-and-a-half-year great tribulation period. Mm -hmm. Because for the first three-and-a-half years, they are going to be in a type of reverse tribulation mm -hmm. where God is going to give them the desire of their hearts under Antichrist, but it's eventually going to kill them and send them to hell. Uh -huh. um, and that's where God's wrath starts, but it's almost in mystery form 
because it's a deception. So would you say that when you're reading Revelation, that a lot of the, 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 the destruction, the violence, the horror that we're seeing unfold, that that's a description of the second of, of, of the second three and a half years? Exactly That we right. don't really pick up a lot. It's mm -hmm. there, but we don't pick up a lot mm -hmm. of the first three and a half right. because the first three and a half years, and maybe a more technical way of saying it is Daniel's 70th week. Yes. The yes. first half right. of Daniel's 70th week is relatively peaceful. Mm -hmm. Question is, coming into that, is there an event? Is it possible? I remember <laughs> reading, is there an event like a global war out of which this Antichrist brings three and a half years of great peace? Mm -hmm. Is there something like that that sets the stage? Well, we are, um, the events that we're sitting <clears throat> today would be one th day 1,485 of 15 days to flatten the curve. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we haven't stopped the count is because the events haven't stopped, the craziness hasn't stopped. Two weeks ago, that Leave the World Behind cargo ship took out the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. Yes. All right, and then Lori showed me three days ago, and this was confirmed by the New York Post, the same type of thing. It was a kitten's whisker away from smashing into the Veranzano Narrows Bridge in New York. Now, what are the chances of a copycat like that happening I don't ever recall a cargo ship taking out any bridge ever. And now two weeks ever. later, it almost happened again. So let me ask you this. Let's talk about that for a second. What do you think happened with that? Do you think it was hacked? Do you think it was an intentional situation? I mean, you can see the lights come on and off. I remember I was looking at your um, website. What do you think? What do you think happened with that? Absolutely, they were hacked. There is no question about it. The only question is, were they hacked by the Chinese, the Russians, or the Americans? Now, Barack Obama made a movie. I know, man. It's right off, right <laughs> off the movie. Leave the world behind, right? Uh huh. Okay. Have you watched it? I have not. You got to watch it. You like it? Well, no. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it at all. But let me tell you something about that movie, okay? Stuff from that movie has been happening since he released that movie. That movie had three different launches. One, the main launch was February was uh, November twenty second of twenty twenty three. You know what happened on February second of twenty twenty four? Ninety days later, three months later, mm -mm. Uh, that's when cell phones, the majority of cell phone service in America, went out for. 13 hours that day. Wow. Okay. All across the country, the majority of cell phones was not working for 13 hours and they still haven't, exp it was a software glitch. Sure, sure. Yeah. It's always a software yeah, glitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that was the very first thing that happens in Obama's movie. Mm. You want to know the second thing that happens in Obama's yeah. movie? A cargo ship comes up on the beach. I've seen the clips of that. Yeah. Well, a cargo ship just took out the Francis Scott Key Bridge. The bridge that's named after the guy who wrote the Star Spangled Banner, yeah. which is our national anthem. Yeah. And and um, so I have told people that if this is what we're seeing with predictive programming, then you get now the next thing on the schedule is a plane has to fall out of the sky. Mm -hmm. And I'm waiting for that. And I believe that that will happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do you think why do you think they make why do you think predictive programming? Why do you think they make movies? Is it a way for them to prepare us? Is it a way for them to to gloat about what they're doing? What, what do you think? Why do you think that is? Have you ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs? Yes. Now we're going way back. Oh yeah. Big thick book, right? And one of the things, a consistent theme that you read in Fox's Book of Martyrs is that when they would find a heretic, he wouldn't pray to Mary, he wouldn't worship the Eucharist, he didn't believe in the Mass, he didn't care for the Pope. Yeah. And they would, they would find that person, they would go to their house. Mm. Now, Maybe he was a family man, uh -huh. and he had a wife with two kids. Maybe the wife was pregnant, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So they're not after the wife. They're not after the kids. They're after the family man who is what they call the heretic. Uh -huh. Well, you know how they tortured him? They tied him up, and then they slowly killed the kids. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then they cut out the baby from the wife, and then they threw the baby in the fire. Yeah. Then they did unspeakable things to the woman. Then they slit her throat and then they threw her on the fire. Uh -huh. And then he gets to be burned alive at the stake with the last thing that he sees before they put his eyes out is his entire family bleeding and 
yeah. butchered in front of him. Right. Now, why not just come after the guy that you're looking for? Because in that sick, satanic mindset, mm -hmm. they want it to be as much psychological, which we would call spiritual, as it is physical. Interesting. Okay. David Rockefeller, and I played the audio clip many times, David Rockefeller, and he thought he was, you know, off camera, yeah. but somebody had a hot mic. And he said that um, the main people that he, he was a founding member of the Bilderberg Group, mm -hmm. okay? He brought in Henry Kissinger and all those people. And he said that the main people that, and he said this in 1992, 93, maybe 94. He said the main people that we owe a debt of gratitude to are the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune for attending our meetings mm -hmm. for 40 years and agreeing to stay silent about them. Yeah. All right. Why would anybody do that? You're hearing horrific New World Order end times things uh -huh. and you agree to stay silent. Yeah. Because you're part of the cabal. That's exactly right. And these are facts. Uh -huh. So we have to understand that that predictive programming mm -hmm. exists because they don't want to just do the deed. They want to psychologically slash spiritually affect you as well. So, yeah, I thought about that before because it goes back, you know, it's the, there's something about the, the fear, uh, for lack of a better terminology, the psychic energy. Mm -hmm. That's why you don't just have the Aztecs killing, you have the ceremony. You don't ah. just have the baby <laughs> right. being killed, you have the ceremony. The drums, the emotion, the drive. There is something about the spiritual, uh, to use a, wor a worldly term, something about the psychic energy, the spiritual yeah. energy of fear, of terror, of blood, uh, of that kind of thing like that, that drives them. It's almost like a spiritual vampirism mm -hmm. uh, that, that they, they feast off of that. And it is, it is stunningly amazing mm -hmm. when you look at that. I mean, we're not just talking about Obama. I mean, there's some spooky stuff we've looked at before. When you look at the Simpsons and their predictive programming of things that have come down the pipe, so it's going to be really interesting. What do you, what do you think 2024 holds? And we're probably, hopefully we don't have to kick this over to Rumble, so we'll be <laughs> we'll be cautious well, about yeah. You laugh, but I am in week two <clears throat> or week three of a three month suspension on YouTube. Get out now. Here's a funny story. Um, Two weeks ago, we did a podcast showing you in graphic detail about the pandemic treaty that's being put out by the World Health Organization. Okay. And I provided all the links and the audio clips in that podcast showing you that Bill Gates uh -huh. is funding it. He is the largest private donor to the World Health Organization, right? And while that podcast was live... I received an email from a company called NewsGuard. NewsGuard is a highly funded far left liberal watchdog website. One of the sites that Bill Gates created to when people talk about him and conspiracy theory, these people go after those websites. Really? Okay. And on the Microsoft site itself, it acknowledges that, um, that they support news guard they do all this stuff wow. and they say that there are 7500 websites that news guard regularly looks at well there are hundreds of millions of websites mm -hmm. a billion websites in the world why is now the end begins one of those 7500 sites Jeez. and i write in the article that i did after the suspension came uh i'm like on one hand i'm flattered yeah yeah okay but while this podcast and the whole podcast was Bill Gates role in the World Health Organization and the pandemic treaty that's coming in about five weeks. Mm -hmm. They send me that vaguely threatening email while the program was live. Wow. When the program was done, I posted it to YouTube and almost immediately it was removed, banned with a very harsh 12 week suspension. Wow. Okay. So, so, this is how now we joke around and it's like, oh, yeah, one day the FBI. Or, yeah. At some point, they're going to come for me mm -hmm. and they're going to come for they you. Are. Absolutely. And with AI now, we were talking <laughs> about this the other day with AI. There's no telling what position they could put you in. 
Mm -hmm. what they could say that you say, what they could say that you're looking at. You mentioned The Simpsons. Yeah. Okay. Up until about six months ago, The Simpsons were a great source of predictive programming. Uh -huh. They no longer are, and I'll tell you why. Because people have, and Lori found it last week, two weeks ago, they have already started to take Simpsons episodes, put them in AI, and make them say things that The Simpsons never said. Really? So now you don't know, well, what's the real Simpsons version and what's the fake one? Well, you know, I think that's interesting because we were talking with um, another, with Joseph Dolmage, I mentioned mm -hmm. an author, and he was real big into AI. And it's funny, he, he said, what's the one battle that Joshua lost? AI. AI. <laughs> he said, yeah, he goes, it's, it's, he goes, he thinks that this is big time in time. Mm -hmm. And he said, the thing about it is, you know, they can make you say anything, do anything. You, you know, he goes, it's unbelievable. It's one of the greatest tools to take out your enemies. Mm -hmm. Because how do you fight that? No, that wasn't me. That wasn't, no, I didn't say that. No, and, but it's too late. It's already in the zeitgeist. It's that's, already out that's there. That's right. And it's not something that actually happened. It's the perception of what happened. It's the happened. perception of what that's happened. Right. And, and that's who they're going after. So, yeah, it, it is going to be very interesting to see. And I'm interested... I'm very interested to see how 24, I mean, we're, we're getting down, you know, if, if the pattern follows, there should be a shooting, there should be some summer riots, you, you know, we should start to get into this, but I'm very interested to see, I can't imagine Joe Biden running again. Back in 2015, I had written an article and, you know, I'm not claiming any great foresee ability, yeah, you yeah. know. But I wrote this article and, you know, sometimes I write these things and I really get into it. I get a little carried away, yeah. you know, and I wrote this article where I predicted that there was going to be a um, assassination attempt on Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And there was when he spoke in Las Vegas, a man with a gun. Now, the man was quickly apprehended, but he was coming. He was almost on the stage and he had a gun. Uh -huh. And then the second thing that I said was that he was going to be reelected. He was going to be elected in a landslide. He won electoral college of 33%. Uh -huh. That's a landslide. Yes. When I said those things in 2015, people said that, you know, how can you say that? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Yeah. And like people stopped coming to the website for about four or five months until the election took place. And I can remember mm. sitting on my patio with a cup of coffee around six o'clock on Super Tuesday or whatever yeah. they call that. And I thought to myself, wait a minute. If he doesn't get elected in a reasonable landslide, I'm finished. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because I've really gone way out in the... And then it happened where that's exactly... And then after around, what, like 920, 940, it drastically went the other way and all these states uh -huh. went red. Um, but that's what I said in 2015. The feeling that I have for 2024... And again, it's just a feeling. It probably won't happen. But I think he's either going to be assassinated, literally, or he's going to be sitting in a jail cell on November 5th. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's hard. I think, and this, you know, I don't want to get us in trouble here, but it is. <laughs> when you start looking at the last election, it's really, really hard because everything is predicated on the fact that it being a fair and uh, fair election last time. And I, I just, I don't see how that works. I don't see how you can come across with that. And so, yeah, I mean, Joe Biden, I, you, you can't run. I, Joe Biden is barely hanging on right now. Right. Uh, but remember when Obama said he was asked if he would if he was to have a third term, if the laws in America could be changed where he could run for a third term, uh, he said, well, ideally, what I would like to do is to find somebody who could be the front man. Uh -huh. And I played this clip a lot. Somebody who could be the front man. And I'd be in the basement with the walkie-talkie telling them what to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, when Joe Biden started running for president back in 2019, mm -hmm. you know what his campaign slogan was? No malarkey. No malarkey. Which is a ridiculous, very Pennsylvania uh -huh, right, uh -huh. thing to say. Very Joe Biden thing yeah. to say. And then a couple months later, everything took a 180 turn. Yeah. And now he's built back better. And I remember the day I'm looking for, well, what is this Build Back Better thing? And uh, I traced it all the way back through about nine different countries in Europe. 
and it originated in the United Nations. <laughs> and then he wins by 81 million votes. 81 million. How is that even possible? Barack Obama didn't get 81 We million. talked about that. I don't <laughs> think that had ever been that many votes before, ever. Right? Yeah. Well, so was the election stolen? There is no question about well, it. Well, and then you look at the Dominion machines, you look mm -hmm. at the My Pillow guy, Mike. What's his name? Um, Mike Lindell. Mike Lindell. Mm -hmm. I watched a lot of his information. Do you remember the? Do you remember that? Was it Christmas Day or the day after? You remember the bombing? Uh, it was Christmas Day, and now was it Nashville? Um, you remember the bombing of the guy, and he was. And there was a lot of reports that the, it just just a weird turn mm -hmm. of events. Mm -hmm. Weird turn of events. So if that happens, do you think Biden is going to run for this term? Do you think he's going to run all the way through? Well, he's already running, and I don't know what the deadline is, but there is a deadline after which you can't change candidates. Mm -hmm. And I think we're very, very close to that that deadline. Now, if they were to switch. He has up until, doesn't he have up until the um, the Democrat the Democratic convention, right? They have to nominate, oh, okay. still have to nominate, right. right? And when is that convention? It's got to be close in the summertime, pretty soon. It's like May or June. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think if they were going to take him out, they would put Michelle Obama in. Mm. That's because. That's she, your theory, isn't it? Yeah. She, well, she she checks all the boxes. Yep. Right? She's a minority. She's a woman of color. She's a woman, right? And among liberals, she's crazy popular. Yeah. And I think that if she was to be the candidate, she would be unstoppable because Donald Trump would not be able to beat Michelle Obama. You don't think so? No. Never even close. Be do you think, and this is a huge, this is a very aggressive statement, but do you think that it's possible that America could devolve into a civil war? And, and what does that look like if that happened? Aggressive statement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's every podcast for the last yeah. eight months. So, so uh, here's my theory, though. My theory <laughs> is that we're still looking at a paradigm of left and right. Mm -hmm. And I think the paradigm is actually the elites and the non-elites. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure, because we're not so regional, we're more urban, suburban, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what a civil war would look like. Uh, but, but I feel like we're on the verge. Absolutely. There is no question about it. This Friday, today is what, Tuesday? Uh -huh. That movie called Civil War. Predictive it, programming all over it's again. It's coming out Friday. Uh -huh. Okay. So, so I think that... Should there be another civil war, and there kind of has to be, that it may be fought on a very different perspective. I mean, for the last 30 years, the entire world, can you remember when the internet first started mm -hmm. and you used to say, wow, look, a hundred million dollars worth of business globally on the internet. Yeah, and yeah. And it got into the billions. Now, if you don't have an app you can't do banking at some banks yeah and, yeah and, and and we have reconfigured our entire way of life electronically uh -huh. europe announced last week that they are going to roll out in the fall the central bank digital currency that's it, big man yeah that, that's that's yeah. huge the huge head big. of the european commission said it's going to be side by side with cash mm -hmm. and then the cash goes away so, and that's when everything gets locked down. Because I remember, you know, the thing used to be, and I'll come back to the Civil War in just a minute, but, you know, when you start looking at the Bible, no man can buy and sell. All these preppers all these years have been stocking up silver and gold. Silver and gold, got to have your silver and gold. Mm -hmm. But if nobody's taking silver or gold, it's useless. Mm -hmm. If everything is digital, it doesn't matter. You could have Fort Knox. But if, mm -hmm. if Walmart is not taking gold, it, it becomes irrelevant how much silver and gold you have. You have to have the digital currency. Mm -hmm. That's how you control. And we're there. 50 years ago, 10 bars of gold would buy you a house. 10 bars of gold will buy you a house yeah. now. And so they have to get rid of that gold. And when you read the Bible, like I forget, it's Joshua 6, 16, or somewhere right around there where it talks about taking the silver and gold into the Lord's treasury. Yes. Okay. Antichrist is not concerned with silver and gold. He's concerned with central bank digital mm -hmm. currency. That's what he's going to want to have. So do you think, to come back to America, what do you think, you've been, you've been thinking about this, what does that look like in America? If we devolve into some kind of civil unrest mm -hmm. and civil war, what does that look like? Obviously, and I, I don't want to tell you what, what to think, but 
I don't know that it feels like a, like like eighteen sixty one again. Mm -hmm. Um, but what, what do you think it looks like? Right, but did 1861 feel that way to the nine southern states who were just simply saying, we're not going to be put under your thumb? No, if, some, yeah. if somebody could have shown them, you know, two foot by three foot glossy pictures of, here's the scary pile of millions of dead of you people, mm -hmm. right? You still want to fight this war? Yeah, so I'm reading right now. I'm, <laughs> right. Reading, I'm reading Shelby Foote's. Uh, he's a classic writer. I'm reading his um, narrative of the Civil War, three-volume set right now. We just watched that Ken Burns documentary, The Civil uh -huh. War, and Shelby Foote, unbelievable commentator. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so he's walking you through it, and it's interesting. Jefferson Davis, all these guys, you know, they wanted to secede, and, and uh, the slavery issue to the side had that fort, had Fort Sumner, then Lincoln knew what he was doing. When he left them there, he had, they let them, they let them, had he marched them out, it would have been a total different, mm -hmm. but he left them there and then tried to resupply them. It was an intentional barb and it just kept escalating, kept escalating, kept escalating. So I've danced around it, but what does this look like? It, you know, if things go south, what happens if Donald Trump loses again, is it our side that initiates? Is it was January sixth a, a, a prep for it? What does civil war look like in America in the in the years ahead? Well, it looks very very different because unlike 1776 and 1861, um, you can't take on the United States government. Mm -hmm. There can't be a civilian uprising in a, a head to head uprising because. It would be wiped out so fast. Yeah, it would be. It would. It, your jaw would scrape on the ground. Oh, yeah. The only way it would have to be done internally, it would have to be done through computers. It would have to be that systems would have to be shut down and take. It's like if you remember back when nine eleven happened, right? Yeah. NORADs running these simulations with jet fighters going out to buildings that have been taken down by airplanes and just coincidentally that's what they were running on that day right right and things were suddenly just taken offline well that's how this when the next civil war happens it's going to be a very different type of civil war i wonder too you remember i oh mean i can't think of the guy's name the general um when trump uh, the general that actually notified the chinese or whatever and said hey listen we you know I'm wondering if there wouldn't be like an internal civil war. How divided is our government? How divided is our military? We are beyond the divided. military is the one that's the yeah. last bastion. How yeah. divided is that? Could you have a situation where the commander in chief orders something and then you have such an ideological, you know, liberal per se, let's say who's a high ranking general says, no, I'm, we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Then you have other groups says, no, we are. Or mm -hmm. a situation where you've got like in Texas, Governor Abbott says, hey, we're calling up the National Guard. And he said, no, no, you're not. I mean, it, you never imagine it could be that way, but it could get there real quick. Well, they have been flooding our country with tens of thousands of illegal immigrants month after month, year after year. And if you study something called the Cloward Piven strategy, mm -hmm. which was developed in the 1960s. The three prong. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. And, and what you have to do if you. And they imagined what would it look, look like to take down America? Uh -huh. Well, you have to collapse the economic, the financial system, the welfare roles. You have to put it into such a position that the people get so dependent upon the government that they are no longer functioning for themselves. You overload the system. Right. And so the people become completely dependent upon the government. And then the system crashes the government. And now there is no government system to give them the benefits. And now everything is in chaos and disarray. You almost could see something happening in some of the inner cities and cities, something like Escape from New York. Well, I think it's happening now. If you remember back in 2020 and 2021, if you wanted to go to a Broadway show, you had to show a COVID passport. They had checkpoints in New York City. And if you tested for COVID, they put you in a hotel. Mm -hmm. Well, in Australia, in New Zealand, they had COVID concentration camps. Yeah. 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 I well, mean, so it's, to me, that was the trial run. Yeah. Yeah. And what does the next thing look like? Just picture 2020 and just extrapolate it by a factor of 10. And that's what the next one's going to look like. Well, the like. big thing I could see happening is, the sh is, is, you know, when things are digital, Mm -hmm. is, you know, whether it's an EMP attack or whatever it is, you, you shut people's access down 
to their money. You shut access down to these things that we're so digitally dependent upon. Uh, you could cause a lot of problems real quick, mm -hmm. real quick, mm -hmm. you know. But I, I often thought here recently about with the uh, Chinese, remember the balloon thing over going over the United States? I mean, if you're going to launch a EMP attack, that's how you would do it. A low-flying balloon over regional areas mm -hmm. uh, and, and you would bring it in. And this is like, man, it wouldn't take very much mm -hmm. to, to tip the thing in that direction. And that's why I've often thought that, you know, we may, we may be careful what you ask for. Mm -hmm. You may get Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And if I had, and I am, if he runs, I'm going to vote for him more I'll than I am. You know, uh, I'm going to vote for him quicker than I am anyone else. But That's right. Uh, but that... But I'm not so naive as to think that he's the magic bullet. Mm -hmm. We could find ourselves in World War III. The guy, the guy has such an ego that it doesn't take very much to torque a guy with an ego mm -hmm. to, to come around and go, well, we need to do this. And all of a sudden, we're, we're, in a, we're, we're already in a proxy war with Russia. Mm -hmm. We're feeding so much arms and money into the Ukraine mm -hmm. um, that it, it could get real dicey real quick. Yeah, well, Trump is not really a very smart person. If you look at how he's been manhandled and kicked around in these four different trials that he is. I mean, somebody with that much money, you can't afford a better lawyer than that. Like, that's the best lawyer you got. I know. Like, you don't win anything I when know. you go to trial. That's that's a bad lawyer. Yeah. You know? So, so I can't... And if you remember, in my mind, the turning point that put Trump in power was the last debate he had with Hillary. Uh -huh. And he said, well, if I was president you'd be in prison. Uh -huh. And then that was it. They cut, it was done. Yeah. The crowd goes crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And he said what everybody was thinking. I think that was the turning point. But you know what he didn't do when he got into office? Mm. He didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. He didn't take care of any of his enemies. And for the next two years, he had nothing but leak after leak after leak because he had Obama people in his own inner circle yes. that he didn't get rid of. Yeah. You know, you, that's not smart. Mm -hmm. Has he gotten smarter? I don't think so. Yeah. Right? He has no plan. Yeah. What's his plan? Yeah. I haven't heard it. No, and it's, it is interesting. It's kind of like, hey, you were better off four years ago, but the world is a different place mm -hmm. today. And, and I go back to that thing. I mean, I had this conversation with a guy not long ago, and he's like, well, you know, Trump this. I'm like, hey, bro, Trump was the guy that marched Fauci out in front of all of us. Mm -hmm. He was the one that bought into all of this, you know, and he was pushing the vaccines as much as anyone else. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you he know, calls himself the father of the vaccine. Right, right. So right. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot on that bone there that I don't think. And I, I really think what's happening is that America is becoming very, very. It's like that piece of wood that's being eaten from the inside by the termites. It looks okay on the outside, but it's rotten on the inside. And what you're seeing is you're seeing all these other countries starting to stack up. Mm -hmm. Russia, China, North Korea is is a vicious place. But you're even seeing places like Brazil and others that they're, they're turning. And it's like, you know what? We just don't need you anymore. That's right. And that's a scary thing. And if the day comes where the dollar is no longer the world's reserve currency, mm -hmm. then they have no need of us. Mm -hmm. That's what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So what? let's go back. Let's change gears just a little bit. What is the future of now the end begins when you look and mm. if you and i'm just going to say you know paul's just a minute ago if you have it you need to go to now the end begins.com you should live there uh <laughs> and when you're not at the soul trap <laughs> you yeah, should amen. be there amen uh and the bible studies if you're not going to church and i don't want to pause just a moment and say if you are in a location where you're not able to uh get to a local church a, a good bible leaving church you need to tune in um, to now that it begins the Bible studies, you've moved them now to... T tell me a little bit about the Bible study. Well, we've been doing the Bible studies for 12 years. Mm -hmm. We do two two-hour Bible studies every single week. And our Sunday service is now a live Sunday service because we're at Bethany Baptist, and uh -huh. we're very close to getting that live streamed. Um, but, but we do all those things. We have programming every other day, every week. Good, so. good. So you need to check that mm -hmm. out. Tell me what is on tap for the future of Now the End Begins. What gets you up every morning? What gets you excited about the rest of 2024 and moving forward? Well, honestly, the main thing that excites me and excites Lori um, is that God is doing this amazing work with our Bible program. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Back in 2018, God put on my heart to just 
provide Bibles for people who listen to the Bible studies because we are a global ministry uh -huh. and, and um, you know, people from all over the world, a lot of people can't afford any type of a Bible. So God put on my heart in 2018 when I found that there was a need to s just reach into my pocket and buy Bibles and to send the Bibles out. And I started sending out like the dollar store Bibles. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. everybody says, well, if you would use dollar store Bibles, and they're such cheap recycled paper, they don't last. You know, you get them for a dollar, but they're not really. I mean, if, if you were going to smuggle something into a prison in Czechoslovakia, yeah. that would be a great Bible. But for regular people on the outside, dollar store Bibles don't work. Um, but then when you get to 2020, and everything started going crazy and people started asking for Bibles on a mm -hmm. global level and God started raising up resources for us to do that. We went from hundreds of Bibles to thousands of Bibles to ten thousands of Bibles to hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of Bibles, New Testaments and scripture portions. Uh, we set this goal two years ago of handing out one million pieces. And when I say pieces, um, a lot of the times you don't get a request for a Bible. It's a scripture mm -hmm. portion yeah. or it's a New Testament. Uh, but one million pieces of Bible literature. We're coming up on 300,000, but just since 2021. Wow. Not since 2018 or the last 15 years. Just in the last three years, that's an average of 100,000 per year. That's now, wild. that's operating at a level that I never prayed about. I never prayed for, I yeah. never asked for it. Um, and yet God says, look, you want to get something done that's really going to last, that's going to make it through the judgment seat of Christ. So we've been doing these things. And over the last, what, two weeks, um, we have 6,000 Bibles going out to eight different jails and two immigration detention facilities. I'm just looking at the website here. Yeah. Uh, today we begin processing two massive shipments of Bibles to the Carnes County Detention Center and South Texas Ice Processing Center. Yeah, now people, a couple people got mad and they say, why do you want to help the illegal immigrant? They are being brought here to take over this country. And our answer is, maybe they are. Yeah. But where is our country? Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's we're seated in heavenly places. I agree. And I'll tell you this. Right. The greatest the greatest thing that would ever help this country is to see a massive amount of illegal aliens get saved. Yes. Yes. You know, if they get saved, then that's going to take gonna care, right, right, that's gonna take gonna care of everything. Us. Yeah. Right. So we started raising money two weeks ago for the Carnes County Center. And that's a place that we have never had contact with before. OK. And they need help. And when these large facilities reach out to us, like 1,300, 1,400, almost every single time the Lord says, send them 1,400 Bibles. I'm mm -hmm. like, but, but, but Lord, that's $8,000. Yeah. He's like, well, why don't you just go ahead and do it? And so we, we do it. And while we were letting people know about that need, then the other place, the South Texas Ice yeah. Processing Center that we did give Bibles to back in 2022, they now need another 1,400 Bibles. And, wow. the, and the guy there, his name is Rene Gonzalez. He wrote me an email and he says, Brother, it takes me an hour and a half to drive across the plains of Texas to get to my job where I work. And he's a, he's a Mexican guy. And he says, um, it takes me an hour and a half to get to my job at the processing center for these migrants, right? And he says, I listen to your Bible studies while I'm riding that hour and a half, uh -huh. and then I teach them what you taught me. That's great. Right? That's where the Bibles are going. In a going. sense, it's almost like the mission field is coming to us. It, it absolutely is. And, you know, when you wrote in your book, The Little Big Church, uh -huh. right, about pastors and ministries, you can be little, but you don't have to be small. Yeah. Right? Exactly. And it's so funny. I had a huge smile come across my face when I first read that because years ago, God was preparing me. He's like, one, one, think bigger. Yeah. Think bigger. And I always had to push myself. It's like, well, but Lord, I'm, I'm small. Yeah. Yes. And he's like, you're not small. You're little. Right. You're new. You just started. Focus on me and think 
bigger. I actually think that the future belongs to the little. Yes. If because it allows us to be nimble. Mm -hmm. It allows us, we don't have to go through a bunch of programs and mm -hmm. conferences and committees. Listen, we're going to hear there's any, but we, you've got to stay nimble mm -hmm. and meet the need. But it doesn't mean you can't be big. I mean, and the impact that we're making is big. Right. And when you realize that, you know, we are coming up on 300,000 pieces of Bible literature yeah. in just the last three years. Uh -huh. And we're just little old. Now the end begins. We're not, you know the Gideons, uh -huh. we're not yeah. the Trinitarian. Yeah, the Y, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not any of those. Those are multi-billion dollar corporations. We're just little old now the end begins, but you call us the special forces, yes, right? And what do we do? God says, look, while everybody's fighting over here, this jail, that no Ader County jail in Stillwell, Oklahoma, yeah, tiny little jail, only holds maybe two or 300 people. They reached out to us, and he's going to be one of the preachers at the camp meeting. And he reached out maybe three years ago and said, we need Bibles. Yeah. I had never heard of Stillwell, Oklahoma. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So we sent him Bibles, and we prayed over him. And uh, about six months after we sent those Bibles, he wrote back and said, brother, we've been handing out those Bibles. We've been ministering the word. Ten women just got saved. Forty men just got saved. I had another chaplain write last month and say, hey, since you sent us the Bibles last year, um, 172 people have prayed to get saved. Wow. So just in the last two years, there are, are hundreds of testimonies of people praying yes. to get saved yes. after receiving those Bibles. So when yeah. you say, what motivates me? Yeah. Is it the next headline about the end times? Well, that motivates me every day. Uh -huh. But what gets me excited, what gets me up out of bed every day, yeah, yeah. What, is what God's doing with this Bible program because it is doing some amazing, mm -hmm. amazing things. That's the thing, I think. We were, maybe before we, we started recording, you and I were talking, maybe it was earlier in the conversation, we talked about staying in balance. Yes. I think that's where a lot of guys get out of balance is there's nothing wrong with being observant and speculating and understanding what's going on in the end times as long as you are evangelizing. To right. me, evangelizing is the, that's the golden mean. That's what keeps you from going off the deep end. And I don't mean evangelizing by getting your whiteboard out and doing a, a, a five-hour <laughs> show in your basement on f YouTube. That's not, I, and I'm talking about looking at different avenues. You know, we do it, the My Christmas Radio, we're in, and we're, I forget how many countries we were in, 140 Amen. countries, Amen. you know, Amen. but thinking big, how can you reach big? Uh, and when you do that Patriot thing, yeah, every that's summer. in October. Well, this this October, we're going to do it the Faith and Freedom Rally. Yeah, that's what it's called. Yeah, yeah. so we do that. We're going to do it right before the election to be uh, as controversial as we right. possibly can. Yeah. Um, we'll come. We'll yeah, come. yeah. <laughs> so you've got your uh, you've got the um, the uh, camp meeting coming up soon. Tell us about that. Tell us the dates of that, and tell us about that. This year, I'm in Honduras preaching. Now, we're very sorry that you're not going to be That's here. That's all right. I know. plan on being there next yeah, year. You that one be. is blocked out. <laughs> That's a done deal already. But uh, I'm in Honduras <laughs> preaching this yep. year. Yep. But Amen. tell me about, Amen. tell me about, tell us about the whole thing. Where did it come up with and, and how did you get started and what's the plan this year? Well, it actually came from Lori and she said mm -hmm. that the Lord is doing so much with Bibles behind bars she said, why don't we make it a Bible behind bars camp meeting? Yeah. So we're going to get Brother Roy Bell from the Open Door Bible Baptist Church, and we we're so excited to have him. And we're getting one of those chaplains from mm -hmm. um, the Ader County Jail in Oklahoma. Okay. Chaplain Steve Harrington, he's going to come. And um, have you heard of Aaron McMahon from CPR Missions? No. you no. got to check him out. Okay. And it's him and his wife and Destiny right um and they travel around the country in an rv he quit his job as a cop to become a full-time boots on the ground street preaching evangelist okay and he's going to be the third preacher because he's going to give us the perspective of this is what we see when we go from town to town yeah, yeah. and uh he is an amazing amazing soul winner tell me about how you came up with the idea for the for the and now what are the dates for that May 17th through the 19th. How did you come up with the idea of having the camp? I've been there three years, I think, right? You, well, it started with, with yeah, me Yeah, yeah, we were there. Okay, yeah. 
How did you come up with the idea and what was the goal? Because it's a very eclectic group of people. Yes. And yet when you're there, they're very passionate. They're very excited about the Lord. They're the greatest yeah. group of Christians. Our NTE beers are the greatest group on the face of the yeah. earth. Um, and, and they are very hungry for the word and they're very supportive of everything. And um, the idea for the camp meeting, and it, it's, it sounds a little silly, um, but have you ever seen that movie Sheffy? Oh yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that like if if you love evangelism, isn't that like the greatest movie? Yes. And I and, think that was an old Bob Jones production, yeah, like nineteen sixty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? I right. remember watching that in youth group when I was real little. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah yep. Well, that whole movie centers around because he is a, a, a circuit riding preacher in the Appalachian Mountains, and he is living in a day and time where the camp meeting is now beginning to fall away uh -huh. because towns are getting bigger and now it's not the only thing in town and he's mourning the loss of the camp meeting. Well, when I watch that movie, that to me is as close to first century Christianity as you're really ever going to get. Yes. And when I attended your last Faith and Freedom rally, and you had that big tent out yep, in the yard, yeah. right? And it was great. It was just so, you know, I'm in awe of every time I come here and you have this, it looks like like just regular people. And yet every need is met. You somehow magically have food. 350 <laughs> people show up. And yet there's always food on the table. Yes. I still don't, I've watched it like three years in a row yeah. now. And I still don't know how, how you pull that off, but... It's an amazing organization that you have here. But when I sat under the big top listening to you preach at the uh -huh. last rally, that to me is a camp meeting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because you're outside. It is a camp meeting. We just put another twist on well, it. Well, right, yeah. right, right. But that's the same thing. So mm -hmm. what we call a camp meeting, you call the Faith and Freedom yep. Rally. But it's, a, it's, it's bringing the town people in under a tent. Yeah. That's all yeah. it is. Yeah. It's old school. It is. Yeah. I think, and we were talking about this earlier, I think that the way forward is the way back. I think the further yeah. we get to, closer we get to the Lord, the more our churches should look like Book of Acts. Stripped down. Yep. Yeah. Very simple, not complicated, very, very simple. It's the simplicity. Power is in the simplicity. And the illustration, and I didn't see that in your book, and I was kind of hoping that I would see it because it's something that you said. But remember at the last rally that you had, and, I, you know, it was great, the tent, the people, and the food. And you said to me, you want to see our building program? I said, sure, I'd love to see it. And you said, see this wall? I said, yeah. yeah. We're going to knock out this wall. I'm like, yeah? <laughs> yeah. And we're going to put three, four rows in, and we're going to put the wall back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm like waiting for the building program. Yeah, yeah. And that's what you said. But you know what? That is the right that stripped down, uh -huh. built for speed. Let's get something done. The sniper on the roof, right? Not firing indiscriminately, but having a target. Being very intentional. Yes. I don't know that the average church today or the average ministry understands what they're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. They're not very, they're not, I'm not trying to degrade them. I'm just, they're not sure what they're trying to accomplish or how to go about it. Mm -hmm. And because of that, um, they're so afraid of being like the world. But you can pick up a lot of truth, uh, not truth, but you can pick up a lot of pointers from the way the world approaches things, mm -hmm. business, that kind of thing like that. And having an intentionality, a, a clear-cut mission, this is what we're trying to do. Again, I go back to the military concept. We, we, are, we are almost guerrilla fighters. Mm -hmm. We are fighting in an asymmetrical war, which means that we have to look at things differently. And uh, I don't know that we're prepared to do that. But I do believe, talking about the test run of 2020, I, I do believe that we're going to see some tremendous persecution come to the church, but not burning in at the stake. I think it's just going to be harder and harder among the brethren. Mm -hmm. um, and there's going to be more and more pressure of how to take a stand, where to take a stand, what to do. And you're going to see that build more and more. I tell you, you know, talking about end times and prophecy, I, have you... Ever could you ever imagine the apostasy in mainstream Christianity that we're seeing at breakneck speed? Well, I did our last Bible study. Today's Tuesday, so that would have been Sunday night. Click on that third icon underneath the Bibles Behind Bars banner, the one where it says debunking the rapture. Yes. 
I was just going to talk about this. And that is the most hated doctrine in the Christian church. Almost across the board. Yes, yes. You can't get the Presbyterians or the Methodists or the New Evangelicals. You can't get them to agree on a whole lot except for we hate the rapture and the King James Bible. Those two. Right. Yeah. And my whole point is, right, let's just say that the pre-trib rapture is not true. It is true. But let's say that it's not true. Right. Wouldn't you want it to be true? (laughs) Right, Right. Right. Because the option is going through the time of Jacob's trouble. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand the glee that Christians take. Like there is a certain segment of people who email me on almost a weekly basis. And the only point of their email is to attempt to steal my blessed hope of the rapture. They send me video after video, watch this video, and you'll realize that you have been deceived by the pre-trib rapture people. And my answer is, let me tell you who didn't teach me about the pre-trib rapture. Peter Ruckman didn't teach me about the rapture. Uh, Clarence Larkin didn't teach me about the rapture. Yeah. C.I. Schofield, uh, uh, John Nelson Darby, and Mary right. McDonald did not teach me. Paul taught me about the rapture. Right. John, in John chapter 14, and I will come again to receive you unto myself. Uh-huh. The Bible teaches me about the rapture. Yeah. Why do you think that modern Christians... Why do you think that they're so opposed to that? Do you think it's, a, it's, it's simply a dispensational? Because the number one big thing on the, on the topic today, or not the topic, but the number one is the reform, or the reform, the reform, the reform, the reform. They're the big guys. Now, they're starting to be with Leighton Flowers and others. There's starting to be a resistance back against that. And, and Leighton and, Flowers, you know, I had him on the podcast last year. He does a great job, um, mm-hmm. and, and, and he is working very hard. But man, you talk about slow going. Yeah. The reform movement is highly funded. They are extremely wealthy and they are vicious. Mm. Like the people who come after you, they are vicious. Yeah. What did you, well, I know we're talking in third person, but I don't, obviously I don't think that Leighton Flowers is is a King James only. I'm not even sure what his position is on eschatology. He's not King James at all. Yeah. But what did you think about your interview, your talk with him and your conversation? What do you think about him and, and. Because I've watched his debate with James White, and to me, James White is can be nasty. He can be mm-hmm. kind of vicious. I'm not I'm not casting dispersion on his motive. I don't right. know what his heart is, mm-hmm. but he comes across condescending. When I first got saved and I started to study the Bible, the one person that I never wanted to talk to about Bible things was a Jewish person, mm-hmm. because in my mind, I thought, "Wow, these people—that's the Jews. They're going to rip me to pieces with yeah, what yeah. they know about the Bible." But when I started talking with Jewish people, guess what I found out? Mm-hmm. They didn't know anything about the Bible. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, James White is one of those people that he's a PhD and everybody is so impressed with what he can write. But when he speaks, he doesn't sound like a PhD. No, no. And he, he's not very smart. Yeah. He has a position that he's memorized. Right. He's not smart. He can't think on his feet. And I think Leighton Flowers mopped the floor with him when they had their debate. Uh Now, um, when I had that podcast with Leighton, what I said to him, now he won't go as far as I go. Like to me, John MacArthur's a heretic, Mm -hmm. not because he's a Calvinist or because he's reformed, but he says things and he repeats them, um, that the shed blood of Jesus Christ did not save you. Mm -hmm. Now he can stand against the California government all he likes and you're not going to shut me down during covid that's one thing right that has nothing to do with what you preach and teach about the bible and to me john mc john john mcheretic yeah john macarthur is a functioning heretic yeah and leighton flowers won't say that but Mm -hmm. i will yeah so what did you think about leighton flowers with the with the interview what was his what's his where does he think that that reformed and and that whole situation is going? Does he see it starting to come back? Or because that's been the dominant for the last twenty twenty five years. That's right. been the dominant on mainstream. And they own the publishing. Uh-huh. You know, we everything that we do, we also put it on sermon audio. Yeah, I didn't know that sermon audio is reformed. Uh, yeah, until I got the email from the head guy saying, if you ever do a podcast bashing John MacArthur again. We're going to pull your channel down. Sweet. I still have that email. Yeah. Right. Wow. Um, so when I say that they're vicious people, they are 
vicious people. Yeah. But I think that Leighton Flowers is still evolving uh-huh. in his... Because, like, when you come out of something, yeah. it, it takes time to shed it. Sure, and, sure. And I tell the story when I got saved in March of 91. I wasn't... There was no Christian leading me to Christ. It was just a King James Bible and John 3.16. Yeah. And so I didn't have anybody to shepherd me and I wound up listening to Harold Camping from Family Radio. Oh, my goodness. Right? I can and, hear the guy's voice now. Yeah. I can hear that. Yeah. And yeah. may we take our next call, and please? shall we have our next call, please? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, man. Well, I actually became friends of Family Radio. They would interview me. I would attend their meetings. And they'd have, like, these local dinners. And yeah. uh, our daughter, Kelsey, sat on his lap when she was wow. babe, about a year old. And for about two and a half years, Harold Camping was my Bible teacher. Yeah, yeah. Because I didn't have somebody teaching me what the truth was. And in 1993, 94, that book that he wrote, uh-huh. you know, 90, 94 question mark, and it didn't happen. Yeah. Um, then people took me off to the side and said, now, would you like to know what the Bible actually right. teaches? But for me, it was a process. Yeah. I started learning real Bible doctrine two and a half years after I got saved, but I wouldn't say that I had a really good grasp of rightly dividing, which is a complex thing, uh-huh. until about 2014, yes. which is 93, 2000, 20 years later. Yeah. And I think sometimes, depending on even how you learn that, there's a danger with rightly dividing of the hyper dividing mm-hmm, to where mm-hmm. nothing is spiritual. Uh, you're, you're not getting spiritual truth from anything other than a few passages here right. and there. And it's right. like, man, you're, you're missing a lot of blessings. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's interesting. I think that there's a, a, a kind of a resistance now toward the reform because it's been so dominant. Um, of course, a lot of Bible believers just don't have a seat at the table simply because of the position that we hold on the King James and of right the dividing. Mm-hmm. And so that, that just is, it's almost like you're, the, you're the, the, the bad side from the other side of town, you know, so you don't even get to be at the, the table. But it is interesting to watch and see that develop. But you're seeing across the board, I just saw the, the Presbyterians, PC, USA or something like that, they're voting. If you don't affirm transgenderism, this and that, you're going to lose your, um, uh, your uh, ordination. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just breakneck speed going on and on. I saw the guy, I think his name is Russell Moore. Uh, he used to be a big time heavy hitter with the Southern Baptists. They're being shattered apart. I the mean, Southern Baptist has become almost an apostate organization. They have mm-hmm. dumped the King James for the ESV. And they are so, I have a friend, I won't say who it is, but I have a friend who sent me some documents about the Southern Baptist Church funding lawyers defending mosques. Uh, yeah, it, I would say this. I think that, that you can be wrong and not false, but th- they're quickly, I believe they have devolved into, in, into apostasy in a lot of ways because when they had like J.D. Greer, things like that. He's horrible. Oh, it is. It's one thing, it's one <laughs> thing like we were talking about at the beginning and maybe even before we were talking about being balanced. You got to be careful about how you're preaching because you're dealing with sinners. You know, it's one thing, it's another thing to embrace the sin. To say, well, it's okay, it's this mm. and that. And, you know, I, I think that that's what's happening in these major denominations. And, and of course, that goes back to the end times. Mm-hmm. We're looking at it. We're seeing it on the front page of your, of Now the End Begins. Everything that's that's happening has been told, and it's building to this crescendo mm-hmm. uh, that, that's coming very rapidly. Ten years ago, I wrote an article um, on how the six color rainbow flag of the LGBTQ was actually a battle flag mm-hmm. and they were coming for your children. Yeah. And I got so much pushback on that. Yeah. And here we are 10 years later. And when I wrote that article, there was two transgender clinics in operation in America. Now there's like 140, 100, yeah. 270. Well, now you've got TED Talks. They're pushing the limits of saying, listen, you know, pedophilia mm-hmm. is actually not, you know, when I act on it, it's actually a normal thing. Right. I mean, we're looking at, you know, I've talked about this, and I think when we did the interview up at your bookstore, we talked about the fact that everyone focuses on in prophecy, you know, as in the days of Noah, as in the days of Noah. Don't forget the days of Lot. Right. Side by side. And Don't forget yeah. the days of yeah. Lot. Yeah. And, and even more so, maybe you could an argument make 
because Matthew, highly Jewish, Luke talks about the pounds versus the talent, very much a Gentile, has a flavor Extremely, to it. Yeah. And so now you're looking at, you better, better watch that out because it's, it's happening. And, and Lot and, and the days of Lot, we're seeing that unfold in America. And it's happening at breakneck speed. So you're not going to believe this, but we've been here for an hour and a half. No. <laughs> an really? hour, yeah, an hour and a half. <laughs> so wow. okay, so we've got the we've got the um, this is going to come out really really soon. So there's time for people to register to yep. go to the camp meeting. All they have to do is go to nowtheendbegins.com. But um, we don't have a whole lot of spots left open. We are about maybe 5% away from being sold out, which okay. is great. We love that. But if I would say that if you want to come to the camp meeting, you better call the bookstore and reserve your spot because they're almost gone. Yeah, real quick, tell me about the bookstore. Where is it located? And tell me a little bit real quick about the bookstore because that's just an amazing place. I love that place. Thank you very much. Well, Lori is the bookstore manager ah. sitting off there to my, my right. And... Um, it is an unbelievable ministry. We have a shipping center right inside the bookstore. People come in to ship packages. And many times they started to do the paperwork for the package. And one time a woman looked really sad and Lori started talking to her. And the woman was just diagnosed with cancer. Yeah. And Lori prays with her right on the spot. Yeah, so it's, yeah. a, it's a very unusual place. But the exciting news that we have, and I guess I'll share it here for the first time. Yeah is that um, we have found this new location in Palatka. Oh, God. And it is a 19th century farmhouse. And it is beautiful with hardwood floors, built in 1865. And it is just the Lord who brought us to that spot because we're going to get all that space and all that room for less money than we're paying That's right cool. now. And so what we're going to do one of the things that I say when people walk into the bookstore for the first time, if I'm uh -huh. working there, I say, welcome to our 19th century bookstore. Yeah. Because yeah. one of the first things that you see are the biographies of yep. Moody yep. and, yep. you know, all this stuff. And I have been saying that for the better part of a year now. Welcome to our 19th century bookstore. Well, now our bookstore is going to be in a 19th century house. That's really cool. And we're going to play on that theme. Okay. And it's going to be... You're going to walk through the rooms of the house where all the books are going to be. Neat. And and so we are, it's going to be in Palaka, Florida, and we are really looking forward to what the Lord. Do you think, do you think that that kind of thing is a scalable thing? In other words, is that something that, that other churches, other ministries can be looking at? Is it, is it, is it something that is a self-sustaining thing? Do you have to bring in a lot of funds from outside? What, what, and, and because the, what you've created is that foot traffic you've right. created the, where you are ministering to needs but you've got people coming in doing the what they're shipping doing. center yeah. yeah yeah i would say that if any other christian organization was thinking about opening up a bookstore is that the thing that you have to keep in mind is that it's only ever going to be a ministry mm -hmm. because unless you want to compromise and like for example we have people who stop in almost on a weekly basis I'd like an ESV study Bible. Yeah. And yeah. you know what we tell them? Yeah. We don't sell that. Yeah. Well, can you order me one? No. no. <laughs> right, right. And then Lori has this whole rack of pamphlets that she will give to them and say, educate yourself and right, read about right. why we are King James only. Yeah. And, you know, with some people, now some people turn around, walk out. Other people have read the pamphlets and they sit down at the table and last week or two weeks ago, some guy bought like two or three Bibles. Wow. He came in for an NIV, reads the pamphlets, Lori's dealing with them, and he buys King James Bibles. Right, right. So you have to, it's kind of like what we started talking about at the start with what you write about in Little Big Church. Uh -huh. you got to remember why you're there. What were you yeah. called to? So if you're going to have a Christian bookstore, you can only sell books that have rightly divided doctrine yeah. unless they were just like a Christian. Janet Kingsbury, is that mm -hmm. Karen Kingsbury? Yeah. 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 Um, you can have novels. Sure. But, but if you're going to sell books that teach the Bible, that are commentaries, 
you're only going to be selling King James Bibles. Yeah. And or that, you're undercutting what you're trying to do in the first place. Yeah, and yeah. you can't do that. But if it works, you wind up, and so far, I mean, we're about to enter into our fourth year in a couple of months, yeah. right? June will be the start of the fourth year wow. of, our, of, our, of our bookstore. And the Lord just blesses it in unbelievable ways. Yeah. And, you know, he keeps expanding it and he keeps bringing in new things and new books and new people and new opportunities. Um, the whole reason why we're at Bethany Baptist Church now is one of the people from Bethany, they didn't have a pastor preacher. Uh huh. He comes to the bookstore, yeah. sits down and has a cup of coffee, uh -huh. right? So that bookstore is a really unusual place. Yeah, yeah. You know? I gotta, you got to let me know when you guys get that move there. We got to come the up The last there. week of May week and of May. first week of June, we, have, we already have it all set to be painted and cleaned. Me. But it is going to be, if you love books, yeah. Bible books, yeah. and Lori has this wish list, that because we're limited now, we have just barely a thousand square feet. Yeah, in the yeah. new place, we're going to have twice as much, plus parking and a yard and all this stuff. We're going to have tables on the outside where people can drink coffee and read books, and yeah. just a really great setup. Um, but and I forgot. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, you were going to be opening it up, and then yeah, yeah. It, it seems like to right me out of my head. no. Sorry, it seems like to me it's just going to be enhancing the ministry opportunities. Oh, it absolutely is. And then when you realize that you're plunking down this King James rightly dividing dispensationally correct bookstore that has the elements to it that you talk about in Little Big Church. Yeah, yeah. For example, the bookstore was only open maybe a year, and no, it was in the first year. We had nothing in the front, yep. and the book nook was maybe three quarters of the way filled. Um, and there was a couple, and they were looking at the books in the back, and they were picking books off the shelf. And then this young man in his mid twenties walks in, and you know he he seemed. My first impression was maybe he was a little bit on the LGBT side, uh -huh. right? And he starts looking around, almost like he's fearful. And then he comes up to the front counter. And he says, um, he said, uh, what would you think of somebody who was a transgender? And uh, I said, well, I would give him the gospel. Uh huh. Yeah. And he said, would you give me the gospel? Interesting. And he got saved. Wow. Right at that counter. Wow. Right. So that's what's being plunked down in Palaka. Yeah. Hardcore, old fashioned, rightly dividing. But whoever walks mm -hmm. through that door. Right? We're going to show them the love of Christ. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Hour and a half has gone by. It is unbelievable. <laughs> but I'm so glad you've been back in the studio. You and your wife spending a couple of days on vacation, enjoying yourself, getting away a little bit. Mm -hmm. We've got the camp meeting coming up. Mm -hmm. We've got the move of the bookstore. We've got the, the prison ministry going on. Yeah. And we've got the end of 2024 going to be very, very unique. Listen, if you've never been to Now the End Begins, you need to go to nowtheendbegins.com right now. You need to check it out. Check out the Bible study. If you're anywhere near Palatka, you need to get to the bookstore. I assume that the bookstore has its own website. Does it have its own website? Nope, nope. No, not it's yet. It's just nowtheendbegins.com. Nowtheendbegins.com. That's the hub. And you, you click on shop. On shop. <laughs> All right. That's where you need to go. That's and right. And be in prayer. It has been so exciting once again. And I feel like we could just talk forever. Amen. But, but Amen. it has just been a real blessing. Make sure to check out Now the End Begins. Once you go there, it'll take you everywhere you need to go. Thanks for being back in the studio. We enjoyed it very much. Amen, brother. Thank you very much. Love you, my brother. Love you, too. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before our thee. But thou by them mightest war and good warfare. War, 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 war.